and 75 feet. Under this, uh, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee Zoological Garden has uh, this program. Today, we have Dr. Katrina uh, Fernandez for expert talk on smooth coated Indian water. I would like to give brief introduction for Dr. Katrina May. She is ecologist and director, wild water uh, research. She is uh, co founder and director at Wild Water Research and deputy coordinator for education and outreach. IUCN and SSC uh, Otter Specialist Group. She also has a strong interest in communicating conservation issue and science to the public and engaging people in participating approach to conserve uh, conservation, including habitat rest uh, restoration, wildlife monitor uh, monitoring, and awareness raising. She has experience uh, working as ecologist in Africa, Asia, and Australia, and she is full time member of IUCN and SSC Otter uh, Specialist Group. Today, uh, her topic is on habitat uh, requirement, ecology, biology, behavior, and threat. Uh, further, I have requested ma'am to uh, focus on some uh, husbandry practice for smooth water Indian water. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning and have a nice day. Hello. Ma'am, you, uh, you are on mute. Uh, okay. Sorry. Good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, very happy to be here today talking to you about the smooth coated otter. Um, uh, so, what we're going to do today is basically talk about uh, otters in general, and you know, a little bit about the Asian otters, uh, then about the smooth coated otter, a uh, little bit about the biology behavior, and then we'll move on to um, the threats. And finally, we'll talk about a few of the animal husbandry guidelines for the species. Uh, for zoos in sp uh, specifically. Uh, so without much ado, uh, take you the first slide. So here's basically a representation of uh, all the otters that are found in the world. There are currently 13 extant otter species. Uh, there's three species, well, there's two species in North America, which is the of the American And um, Later, I think I'll uh, Central uh, America, we've got the new tropical otter, and then in South America, we've got the giant otters, marine otters, and the southern river otter. Uh, these are all in the new world, and of course, then if you move to the right uh, from the African continent, you can see that there are three species there, which is the uh, Congo clawless spotted necked and the African clawless otter. Um, and then, of course, in Europe, we have one species, which is the Eurasian otter. And this species actually has the longest range uh, as far as otters are concerned. So you get them all the way from the United Kingdom, uh, right through Europe, uh, all the way down into Southeast Asia. So that's got the widest sort of uh, range uh, of all the 13 species of otters. And then in Asia, we have uh, three other species. And then including the Eurasian otter, there are four species. Uh, some of the literature will say that there are five species of otter in Asia because they also include the sea otter, uh, which technically has a range through the Atlantic Ocean coast uh, and then comes into Japan um, occasionally. Because it is, it was highly traded in the, 90, in the 1800s, the species has uh, population has declined dramatically which has resulted in very small fragmented populations of sea otters, and they barely actually now appear anywhere in Japan. So technically, yes, there are five species in Asia. They, the fifth species, which is the sea otter, hasn't really uh, been around uh, consistently, consistently in the last three decades. So because of that, we generally refer to four species being present in Asia. So what are the four species in Asia? Um, Ma'am, have... hello. Yeah. Ma'am, your slide is not showing on our uh, in the, uh, website or... Can you see it now? We, on our display, they are on uh, social media, they are not uh, unable to see this slide. If possible, once again, you can start on sharing. Yeah. Okay. I can, I, I'll have to log out and start again. No, no, any, only you just uh, re-share uh, all the, uh, start from starting. Okay.
Then once you stop sharing and again restart, only sharing option. It doesn't give me that option. It says leave event. It doesn't say stop share anywhere. It says video. You have not uh, started sharing, I think, option. We are not displaying on the display. It's coming, it's loading. Okay. Can you see the loading screen? In, on our screen already all the whole presentation is loaded. So what is the issue? It's not moving. Yes, it's not yes. moving. After live this Control of it, right? Yes. I think uh, it is a loading issue with your PC. We have already loaded uh, on our screen. Okay, now can you see everything? Yeah, we are seeing, but on uh, social page, uh, it's not uh, uh, running. You, you want to uh, uh, stop the sharing and again restart sharing. I started. This is the new sharing. This is me yes. sharing again. This is it. Can you see it? Uh, change the slide one uh, second or third, please. Hi. Sign it as a video. Right. And it's by. I'm on the third slide now. Can you see it? No. No, no, no. Not upload. We have just on our presentation part. Sir, somebody keeps changing it. I put it on the third slide. Somebody has changed it to the fourth slide. I think you have control over it. Have you, now, yes, now it's on first slide. It's gone to the first slide. I didn't do that. Somebody else is doing that. It's open from our side. So then you operate it, no? I, I won't do anything. You, know, you can continue at your own. No problem. Continue. No problem. Okay. Hmm? Okay. It's being shared now? Now, yes, yes. Now. We are displaying okay. the first slide. Okay, do you want me to start again or? You can continue. Okay, see, so I didn't do anything. You change the slide. Ah, you, you continue from your end. As for your uh, requirement, you can change your slide. No problem. Because then... Okay, so now we're talking about the Asian otter species. So there are four species in Asia. The Eurasian otter, the small coated otter, the hairy nose, and the small clawed otter. Uh, both the Eurasian otter and the hairy nosed otter belong to the genus Euthra. Uh, and as you can see over here, they are morphologically quite different to the other two species. Uh, they have a much more elongated skull, flatter snout, a protruding snout, uh, whereas the smooth coated and the small clawed otters have a much more rounded dome shaped skull and a shorter snout. Uh, the smooth coated otter belongs to its own genus, and there's only one species in there, which is Euthra again. And the small clawed otter belongs to the genus Aeonex. Uh, there are three other, there are two other species in that genus. Uh, and both the smooth coated and small clawed are actually genetically sister species. So they're very closely related to each other. Uh, the small clawed otter is the smallest otter species in the world. Um, and of course, uh, heavily traded in, in illegal wildlife trade. And we will talk more about that uh, through the presentation. So just to give you a better idea and understanding of the morphology and how we go about identifying otters, uh, we use specific traits, which include uh, the cranial morphology, uh, the shape of the nose. So if you go through these images, you see that each of the species has a different shaped nose. The reason we do this rather than uh, paying attention to to the fur and the paleage is because some um, the paleage uh, even of the smooth coated otter, for example, can vary greatly from 
uh, region to region within its uh, habitat types. So uh, a smooth coated otter in, in South India might look much more gray or darker brown compared to an, a smooth coated otter perhaps in Singapore. So there are lots of variations in the color of the fur and that's why we don't depend entirely on the paleage. We actually look at other morphological characteristics. Uh, that's one reason. The second reason, of course, is uh, otters are a high value uh, commodity in the illegal uh, wildlife trade. And a lot of times we get confiscations of uh, otter fur, otter body parts, and things like that. And we can only identify what the species is then based on uh, certain morphological characteristics, such as the shape of the rhinarium. The rhinarium is uh, referring to the, the pad of the nose. So if you look at the smooth coated otter on the right bottom, you will see that um, it's got a very T-shaped uh, distinctive nose compared to perhaps the small clawed otter, which has a, a W shape on its nose and, and star shape for the Eurasian otter. So that's sort of the focal point. Uh, these, the, these are hand illustrated drawings that took a long time for Max to do. And they are actually absolutely you know, in line with uh, what the species uh, looks like. So it's a very good representation uh, to follow for uh, trying to identify the different species. Now, moving on uh, to the smooth coat water itself, uh, this is the species uh, uh, of otter that has quite a large range throughout Asia. So it begins, um, there's a small, so it has three uh, distinctive um, subpopulations. So there's the uh, Lutrogale perspicillata maxwelli, which is a subspecies, uh, which is found in the Middle East. Uh, here you can see, uh, if you can see my cursor, uh, it's showing uh, next to uh, Iraq. Uh, that there is one population, but that has actually extended all the way to North and South Iran. So we've been getting a lot of new information of otter presence in uh, in Iran, especially in the southern part of Iran. Um, then moving further, you come to uh, Pakistan and you have another isolated population there, which is uh, Luthergate perspicillata syndica. Now, we don't really know much whether this is an isolated population or whether it is actually uh, able to mix uh, with the rest of the population which is uh, on the map, which is Luthergale per specilata per specilata. Um, lots of studies need to be in the general area and location of the Indus Valley. We don't really know much. Uh, that is a large uh, research gap area. Uh, the rest of the map is basically showing you Luthergale per specilata, which is the, the third subspecies which has a range extension throughout Asia, uh, essentially uh, starting in India and moving through uh, Myanmar, going down into Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and parts of Indonesia. Uh, they're also found uh, in Borneo, as you can see, there's small pockets here and there that have been uh, identified. There are lots of gaps in the data. So this is a very sort of, um, this is based on a lot of historical information and it's not been updated a great deal. And it's not perhaps uh, specifically done. For example, uh, it may not actually be present in all of these parts of India. And perhaps in central India, there are now pockets of the species. So we really need to update uh, this map and, and get to know a little bit more about where the authors are present uh, in, in greater detail. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that we need a lot more research. Um, I'm sure we are all aware of the legalities of the smooth coated otter. It's protected under Schedule 2, uh, Part 1 of the Indian uh, Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. It carries a lot of um, um, uh, you know, penalties uh, for, for in, you know, handling the animal, keeping the animal, training the animal, etc. Uh, perhaps the act itself is archaic in terms of the amounts of money that you have to pay uh, in regards to penalties, something that needs to be revisited perhaps to, you know, make sure that people are actually um, um, avoid the situation. CITES um, is Appendix 1. So the species was uplifted to CITES Appendix 1 in August 2019 after, you know, a lot of uh, help from um, India and the Philippines. Uh, who actually nominated for it to be uplifted to Appendix 1. It was in Appendix 2 prior to that. Uh, so this essentially means that there's no commercial trade available. 
uh, or allowed rather for the species um, and you need export and import permits uh, well you definitely need export permits uh, to send the animals if they're going perhaps to a zoo or to an educational uh, institution in a different country so that's very briefly sort of the legalities of the species uh, moving on i'm just going to talk about the habitat okay. so the smooth coated otter is an extremely versatile animal uh, much like leopards in a sense for those of you who are familiar with that they have a lot of variable habitat types that they can uh, survive in this you know extends all the way from coastal zones to tidal zones to freshwater human made reservoirs um, you know lakes uh, ponds uh, artificial fisheries you can find them in uh, plantations in southeast asia so anyway essentially that has uh, water where it has fish uh, and where it can sort of survive uh, the species is found uh, historically, in the literature, you will see that uh, they say the lowland species that do not get smooth coated otters above 750 meters above sea level. This is again not true. Uh, smooth coated otters have been recorded in Bhutan at snow level, playing in the snow. Uh, so they are extremely versatile and able to adapt to a whole wide range of environments. Um, in uh, Goa, where I am based and the wild otters research is based, we study this wooded otter uh, in a sense urban setting. Uh, so we get wooded otters right through in, in canals in Panjim City, they have been reported. But we mostly study uh, the animal outside protected areas in uh, semi urban urban environment. So this is an image basically of mangrove environment in uh, Goa. You can see that there are three otters in the center of the picture that are uh, eating some fish in the background you can see uh, there's a housing colony and to the right of the same actually there is a road and uh, a lot of traffic and things like that so again like i said it's a very versatile animal is able to adapt to a lot of situations and environments um, and again this is another image of smooth coat outer habitat in goa this is uh, in a fishing pool, uh, we call the Kazan system, which is a type of aquaculture agriculture system that is endemic to the state of Goa, uh, which basically means there are man made fishing pools. So, what you're looking on your screen is a man made fishing pool. I'm standing on a bundle that separates the river from the fishing pool. Uh, on the right, you can see we have put up a camera trap, and uh, we're actually standing on top of the river entrance uh, over here. So, the den entries is facing. Uh, on the bund um, over there. So this is giving you kind of an idea of what the habitat looks like here in Goa. So what is the smooth coated autumn morphology and why is it you know different? How is it you know adapted to to its own uh, you know existence? So this is an apex predator. We all know this. It is part of the food chain. Uh, it is semi aquatic. It lives. Um, uh, on land, but it forages and looks for food, and and most of its locomotion and movement between spaces is done in water. So it's a semi-aquatic animal, and it has adapted uh, morphologically uh, for survival in those uh, sort of uh, situations. Uh, this is the largest species, as I said. So it measures about 1.3 meters from you know the head uh, from the snout uh, or the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. Um, and uh, it has an average weight of about 10 uh, kilograms. Uh, because of this, they eat 10% of their body uh, weight. So if the animal is 10 uh, kgs, then they need to eat one kg of fish a day. Uh, that's kind of um, how that works. Um, as you can see from this image, they have a lot of whiskers. Uh, the whiskers are not just coming out of their uh, cheeks, uh, they are underneath, they are under the chin, you can get whiskers all the way down. So we think this is an adaptation that they require to help with foraging underwater. So they don't just depend on eyesight and, and hearing, they also depend on uh, those whiskers picking up uh, signals in the water so that they can uh, specifically identify where their prey species are and, and get a hold of them. Um, so moving on, you can see here the uh, specific, uh, you know, adaptation. So you can see that they have this very flat tail. The base of the otter's tail is like round and cylindrical, and then as it comes towards the end, the tail becomes flat. And it kind of works like a rudder. 
Uh, so it has an up and down movement, uh, which allows it to swim uh, and, and generate free, uh, speed and momentum. Uh, the other thing that helps with movement in water, of course, is the, the webbing between uh, the pores. So you can see on this image, there is webbing that comes all the way up to the front uh, for digits uh, of the fingers. And, uh, and that's for both uh, the front and the back legs. And of course, it has these toes. And it also has a lot of, uh, the fingers are very dexterous because they have to be able to hold on to their prey. Uh, while in the water and feed on them. So these are very uh, uh, important characteristics of the otter, and this is what distinguishes them from other mustelids, which is the family group that they belong to. Um, and moving on here, you can see this image is basically showing you that it's a very you know, uh, distinctly built body, it's very heavy frame uh, on short legs. Uh, and, and again, this uh, helps with um, their movement in water and on land. Um, this is an image just depicting their apex predators, their you know carnivores. You can see those very strong canines, um, very necessary for eating just pure meat. They obviously eat carnivores; they, they have uh, uh, no need to eat anything other than meat. Uh, sometimes you will find some vegetation being consumed, but it's uh, it's not a part of their diet. They're predominantly fish eaters. 80% of their diet is fish. Uh, they will also take things like shrimp, lobsters, um, sometimes birds, turtles, snakes, and amphibians. Uh, that depends entirely on uh, where they are, and, uh, what the water and prey based situation is. So if they're in a river ecosystem that, you know, has limited amount of prey during the summer months or whatever, then they will look for alternative sources. Predominantly fish is what they like to uh, consume. Um, so the biology of the smooth-coated otters. This is one area of study that is you know, quite uh, limited. There is a lot more information that is required. We, have, we do have a certain amount of information, but a lot is changing as we go along. So to start off with, this is the social species. Um, there are 13 species of waters in the world and not all of them are social species. Are solitary species. Uh, and some of them can be social or solitary. So that's a very interesting thing that we are beginning to understand. Um, so the smooth coated water is a social species. It's a social carnivore. And we are trying to understand what the benefits are uh, of being a social carnivore. You, if you look around, uh, the animal kingdom, there are not many uh, carnivore species that are social. Uh, you get most of them are solitary animals. As a social species, they do have family groups. We call them family groups and they have social hierarchy. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, a male and a female that we call the alpha male and alpha female. They leave the family group. Historically, we thought that they were monogamous, but this may not be the case. They do retain that hierarchy and remain in that position, but they do perhaps actually mate with other males and females in. In, in, in India, specifically, they move in the monsoon. The larger the family group, the average of course per female tends to be uh, two. If it's a new family starting off, then sometimes you do get three pups at a time, etc., uh, etc. Et so it, it seems to be dependent on what the family group size is and how many females are actually reproducing at a time. Um, Gestation period is between 64 to 67 days, uh, anywhere between those times. The animal, the pup are born, they're blind. Uh, they remain blind for at least three to four weeks. Uh, they remain inside their natal dens during that period of time. Um, they are not innate swimmers. They have to learn how to swim. Uh, therefore, uh, that again seems to be a family exercise. The whole family group gets involved with swimming lessons. Um, uh, here you can see this image of an, a pup actually riding on the back of a mother. Uh, they're quite uh, helpless when they're born. They have to be, you know, moved around 
like this in most situations. Um, they are weaned at about five months. Uh, so basically, uh, they learn how to swim, then they learn how to forage, then they learn how to you know, catch their own fish, and they wean at uh, about five months. They reach sexual maturity at about 12 months, and then there is a certain amount of dispersal that goes on, and perhaps this happens anywhere between 12 months and 24 months. Again, something that we're trying to understand, we don't understand the dynamics of uh, whether it's just males that are dispersing or whether it's a combination of males that are dispersing. We do not understand those drivers yet, uh, and something that uh, is very important for the future and to understand the conservation needs of uh, the species. Um, so the previous image, of course, showed movement, you know, being carried around in, on land, but this also happens in water. So in both locations, there uh, there is a certain amount of uh, familial uh, movement and, and um, handling of the pups. Um, they are absolutely suited to, to being able to move on their own um, as well. So these, uh, this uh, image basically depicts some of the sorts of behaviors that uh, smooth coated otters as a family group display and that are important. Uh, of course, social, uh, so beginning with movement, they use both on land and water. They have you know, well adapted um, uh, morphological features to, to kind of sustain that. We've already discussed that. Uh, behavioral wise, you know, rest is a very important thing. Uh, that uh, otters partake in. So they have a very interesting sort of day that they follow a routine, which includes, you know, you know they, they come out of the den, they go out, they forage uh, for a, a specific period of time, uh, they eat in the water, they forage in the water, they come out, uh, then they groom on land, uh, they rest on land for a period of time, and then they return to the, um, to the water and repeat. And they do this a couple of times, and then they retreat back into the den, perhaps for the mid midday. It depends where they are and what what sort of uh, whether they are displaying nocturnal or manual behavior. Um, here in the mangroves in Goa, in this urban, you know this semi-urban environment, they tend to be active predominantly in the early morning, during the night, and in the late evening. Uh, during the daytime, they seem to be uh, in their dens. Uh, this is. A, because perhaps of the prey behavior, but also because of human disturbance. We have a lot of fishing going on. There are boats in the water, ferries, uh, and of course also temperature. Goa has a constant temperature between 32 and 34 degrees midday temperature, uh, perhaps which is not conducive to um, otters being active uh, through midday. Uh, the other thing uh, that we need to consider here is tidal patterns as well. So that seems to be playing a large part in their foraging behavior. They tend to be more active when uh, tides are uh, mid to low tide rather than because at low tide they're foraging. Activities sort of. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, in an extremely wild environment, for example, in, in a protected area like uh, a Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary down in South India, they will rest on the banks of the river uh, exposed and not be in their dens, which is not the case in a semi-urban environment. They do not see them actually resting on the banks. They come, they uh, sort of groom and roll around on the banks, uh, they defecate, and then they retreat to their dens. They do rest in front of their dens, but again, for a very limited amount of time. So there is a behavioral change between uh, species in um, a semi-urban environment compared to an extremely wild environment. Uh, and that, that is uh, some of the results that have come out from the, from the research that we are doing. Social activity, uh, which is the next important thing, is, um, is very important in, in the family groups. And this is done uh, for maintaining hierarchy. So when I say social activity, I'm talking about allo grooming, which is grooming yourself, uh, auto, I'm sorry, auto grooming, which is grooming yourself, allo grooming, grooming others. There's a lot of play behavior between different individuals uh, in the group uh, when they are outside water and inside water. There's a lot of touching. Um, and then the other things that they do is essentially uh, the behavior of sprinting, which is the point number five, uh, which is defecation. 
this is a social activity as well and i will show you a couple of images that are coming up uh, to further display and and, and uh, explain that uh, so social activity very important and then foraging now foraging which is basically going out and looking for food is also a social activity and it is uh, done together everybody the entire family group goes out they forage together and in a specific way but the actual uh, activity of eating is a solitary one they do not share food really they catch their own food they eat their own food and will not really share their food uh, adults will share food with uh, uh, juveniles uh, before they are weaned of course but that is the extent to which that uh, takes place so i'm just going to show a range of sort of photographs depicting the different behaviors that we just discussed so this is typically resting behavior you see that they are always in a group. They are touching each other. They are close to each other. Um, there's always one author that is kind of vigilant and looking around and trying to maintain that everything is safe in their uh, surroundings. Um, and then again, we have uh, you know the physical touch between authors is very important. So there's always a tail overlapping a paw or a face, uh, and they're constantly changing position and maintaining that. Um, sort of social structure and behavior. Uh, this is typically vigilance behavior. So they stand up on you know, their hind feet and they start looking around. This is usually if they have found uh, some disturbance in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, in an in a urban setting, that's usually you know, loud noises like trucks or, or airplanes or things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's typical vigilance behavior. Uh, this is a uh, play activity, so they're touching each other, smelling, grooming, uh, a whole sorts of things. This happens usually on land, but it also happens in the water. Um, you will see here, again, this is a female. You can see clearly the four uh, She's standing up. This is vigilance behavior. A very interesting thing you will see is that all the babies or pups are in the, in the middle while the adults are around. Uh, again, a very interesting social activity where they're kept protected all the time. And this is the benefit of being uh, a social carnivore is that you uh, get a lot of social protection um, from the family group. Um, uh, this is in the middle of foraging behavior. So sometimes they will be foraging and eating, and then they decide that they want to you know, sort of play, uh, and they're quite rough with each other, and they jump and, and, and things like that. Uh, but this also could be the beginnings of mating. So smooth cold waters mate in water. They haven't been seen mating on land uh, that we know of. There is no record of this happening. Uh, we don't know if it happens or doesn't happen. But as of now, it seems to be that it happens in water. Um, and then uh, this is an image of typical foraging behavior. So the smooth coated water, as I said, uh, socially foraging, so they form a V-type pattern in the water, which is usually the most advanced of the family group, which is the older members, they form a V formation with them leading the group with the younger ones in the center or on the outside, but towards the tail end. And what they do is basically swim out and they push all the fish towards the shallower area uh, in the river. And that makes it easier for them to go and catch the fish and, therefore, and then eat it. Most of fish is eaten in the water itself. So they hold on to the fish. They eat the fish head first. Um, if the fish is too large, uh, they will take it to a shallower area uh, uh, and eat it there. Or they will take it onto the banks of the river and eat it there. If the fish is too large, sometimes you will notice that they will not eat the whole thing. They will eat the best parts. And as, bio, as field biologists, we do look out for half-eaten fish on the banks of the river to identify whether the otters have been there or not. But it's not something that we rely on as field biologists because it doesn't happen very often. Um, in the case of juveniles, uh, sometimes otters will leave their babies on land and, and they will bring food to them. Uh, in the case of this lobster here, uh, they have brought this and they allow them to sort of uh, learn how to, to handle them and, and eat them on land. So this is typically a uh, sprinting behavior that I mentioned before, which is point number five on that slide of the type of behavior. Now, this is an extremely social activity. 
they urinate and defecate at the same time and they do it as a group. Um, now, family sizes can range anywhere from four to six individuals uh, to, you know, 20, 22, 24 sometimes. The largest group size I've seen is 28 individuals and sprinting takes place all at the same time. Everyone does it at the same time. But there is social hierarchy displayed here where the male and the female, the, the mating pair, the, the alpha male and alpha female, will be the last individuals to defecate after everybody else. And then they do this behavior where they smear it. So they use the flat tail uh, to, to come and do something that we call the poop dance, which is basically they wiggle their behinds and use their tails to smear uh, all of that fresh um, scat. And what that does is basically it, it widens the area where that scat is displayed. So if there are any, you know, other family groups in the area, they will come here and they'll say, okay, this is a large family group. There seem to be many otters here. It also releases all the pheromones and hormones that are in that, in that scat up into the air so that animals can smell it. Um, and the idea that the two hierarchical male and female are doing this is to reinforce that we are the bosses of this family. Uh, and therefore, we will do the smearing and take control of that. And we will be the last to defecate. So there seems to be a lot of information that is being spread um, through this process, not just to the family group itself, but to uh, any other family groups in the area that might think of occupying this ter territory. Um, and of course, as scientists, uh, SCAT, as you know, is, is the most important aspect of what we do. We get a lot of information uh, from the SCAT with regards to what otters are eating, um, what their diet consists of predominantly. Uh, we see a lot of uh, hooks and, uh, uh, and nets and plastic and things in uh, the defecation. So that's a good indication of the health of the otters, the general threats to otters in that uh, location. So we get a lot of information uh, from, from uh, the SCAT. We also get information about how many males there are, how many females there are based on you know, the analysis that can be done on the chemical structure um, and things like that. So moving on uh, to the threats uh, of the species. So of course, one of the largest threats to the smooth-coated otter and all otters in that, for that matter are human beings. Um, so going back to the fact that we work here in Goa in a semi-urban environment, this is typically one of the problems uh, faced by otters. A lot of human de uh, development, a lot of landscape changes, a lot of obstacles in their habitat types. Uh, this, of course, is a photograph from uh, Singapore. It's not from here, but uh, you can see here that there is a fence. The otters are stuck on either side, and they have adapted to be able to move across and get to the, to the other side. But this is something that we need to consider and, and manage for if we want to coexist in the same spaces as wildlife. We need to be aware of, you know, what the shortfall, what we are doing to create, you know, problems for these species and try and manage and, 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 and create development so that uh, both can coexist happily in the same space. Plastic pollution, of course, is the largest and most important, you know, aspect of uh, the current threats to the species. Uh, there is so much microplastics, large plastics. Uh, again, here you can see this water uh, handling a large plastic bottle, um, perhaps thinks it's something to play with. But these things are being consumed and we do have evidence of it uh, in the scats when we do scat analysis. So this is definitely, definitely a threat uh, to otters. Um, fishing industry, of course, here you can see there's a pup that had uh, gotten caught in a fishing net, uh, and this often leads to drownings because they cannot uh, escape. Uh, if you look at this otter down in the bottom photograph, uh, there is a lure and a hook, a fishing hook stuck in its in its paws. Uh, on the top, on the right photograph, you can see that there's a fishing hook stuck in the eye uh, of the otter and also a fishing hook stuck in the chin of the otter. So this happens a lot of times. Uh, in a lot of cases, nothing can be done. Uh, we don't have 
um, the veterinary assistants to sort of help these animals. Uh, they get infected, they might lose the eye, uh, the infection might spread, they might not you know, have the ability to, to walk or to continue eating, and then eventually they will die. So uh, that's uh, something also to consider and, and, and understand. Uh, this image here, you can see this auto on the, uh, has a kind of a ring around it. Um, basically, that was a plastic ring that got stuck on the auto when it was a pup. And then it started growing and the ring started growing into its flesh. Uh, eventually, luckily, this is again another, this is an auto from Singapore that uh, the Singapore Zoo managed to uh, tranquilize and, and take that ring out and treat it and then re-release it into the wild. Um, so this, this auto got lucky, of course, but it's not something that uh, uh, can happen all the time. And there are not many saviors for these species, for these otters uh, in other locations. Um, this image actually uh, was a video that unfortunately is not playing, but um, what you're looking at here is a road and, and in the center of this road is a defecation area. Uh, again, going back to urban environments, semi-urban environments and otters using specific uh, locations and adaptations. So this is a defecation area throughout the year. And uh, there is the video actually depicts a scooter, a motorcycle coming down whilst they were uh, defecating and then they all dispersed, um, went onto the, into, the, into the vegetation. And then as soon as the motorcycle passed, they all came back and resumed uh, defecation uh, and smearing of defecation. So... Uh, you know, that is a very interesting uh, ability. They understand that, you know, humans are coming. They understand the sound, the light of the motorcycle. They understand that they need to kind of move away and then they can return. So that, in a sense, is an adaptation to surviving and coexisting in human spaces. Uh, again, this is another video that we can't, unfortunately, play. Uh, but one of the biggest threats... Um, currently in India and, and increasingly in other parts of Southeast Asia is dogs. Uh, and when I say dogs, I'm talking about feral dogs, which are essentially your street dogs. And increasingly over the last two years, you know, with COVID, uh, the threat has increased dramatically. What has happened is uh, prior to COVID, a lot of street dogs were getting food uh, through hotels and restaurants and people and this, that and the other. And uh, with numerous lockdowns, that food source kind of diminished dramatically. So they had to go out and, and find their own food sources. And that typically ended up being wildlife. Um, and we're talking about auto, you know, dog uh, conflicts with birds, water birds, uh, and also with otters. So this was essentially a, a video of a group of uh, feral dogs attacking otters. Uh, in this case, otters actually uh, won the battle but we do have a lot of footage from our camera traps where otters have um, not uh, survived. We have lost pups uh, and things like that to, to dog or to conflict. So apparently, uh, you know, apart from the direct conflict of, you know, incurring injuries and, and things like that, dogs will also pass on rabies uh, and, uh, and canine distemper to dogs, I mean, to otters. So the, there is a lot of uh, uh, transferable diseases that can get into the otter population that could also increase their risks of um, population decline. So this is, uh, again, another image of typical um, issues that we, you know, create landscape, landscape changes that we are creating that we are not even aware of that we need to start addressing and, and being aware of. Uh, as I showed in one, some of the previous footage, uh, the otters have a very short uh, short legs and a stocky body which kind of prevents their movements on land to a certain degree because they cannot you know be climbing extremely vertical surfaces and things like that they do need steady steep banks and things so it does become difficult for them to traverse between uh, spaces and having concrete um, uh, walls like this definitely doesn't help um, this is typically one of the issues that we are dealing with here in Goa, so you can see here, this is a bund. So this is a retaining wall, right? So this is separating two water bodies. It's man-made. And traditionally, this was only two, two feet wide. You no, know, it was only 24 to 30 inches uh, wide. And it was only for walking on. Uh, 
Um, now, increased development means that, you know, they're bringing in JCBs and they're filling this in and they're making it so that even vehicles can go on these retaining walls. But to support that, then you need a concrete structure. So they are, you know, creating these large concrete structures on either side and then filling it in with mud. Now, the otters cannot climb these steep walls. They don't have the ability to move from one side to the other. And that is fragmenting their habitat a great deal. Um, and this, again, over, over periods of time, we have come to understand that, you know, 30 centimeters is the ideal height. Beyond that, they cannot climb. So we are now, you know, addressing this by talking to forest department and to panchayats and trying to get them to understand that even if they have to make these walls, they should make uh, areas where otters are present to put sort of a step system so that they can come up and go down. Um, as and when they need to. The other threat to otters, of course, is the illegal trade. Uh, so here you can see this is an otter uh, fully stuffed that is on display in a market in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, but I'll give you some statistics. Uh, we, um, in 2016, published a traffic report uh, with data from 1980 all the way to 2015. This is very briefly, the results of our report, and it shows that a, it's a, it is indeed a high value pelt. Most of the illegal seizures were with leopard skins, tiger skins, uh, bear claws. That is kind of uh, where otters are predominantly found. Um, otter skins are used uh, as, uh, as clothing. Uh, they make hats out of them. They make coats out of them. Uh, it's also used in traditional medicine, uh, Chinese medicine. Most of the market is China. Um, and if you look at this graph, you'll see that up to 2005-ish, it was mostly dead animals. So it was usually body parts, claws, uh, penises, uh, fur, and those sorts of things. And then after that, there's been a very steep uh, decline in that and an increase in the live uh, auto trade for the pet trade. Okay. Um, India, unfortunately, in this data set uh, proved to be the highest exporter of uh, auto pelts and auto parts. And that is not necessarily an indication that we are the highest exporter, but more also to take into account that we have a better enforcement than perhaps uh, many parts of Southeast Asia. So of course, there might be a lot more going through the borders in Southeast Asia that is not being caught, uh, whereas uh, we did catch a significant amount of data. It was almost 60% uh, of the data set that uh, came out of India. So we did come on the top of the list of an exporting country. Most of it was uh, going through uh, Nepal into China and also going into uh, Southeast Asia via uh, Myanmar or Burma, whichever you want to call it. Uh, the, the, the pet trade is now increasingly uh, on, the, on the rise. A lot of the, the sales are happening online. So this is from Facebook. A lot of the trade is happening from Southeast Asia. So they put up these images uh, for about 24 hours to 48 hours. And they sell these up and they take it down and then they repost so that they don't get into trouble. Uh, and there's, there's a very quick uh, turnover. Uh, of what's going on. So they can't really be cyber tracked as well unless the post is there for a long period of time. Uh, basically, they put up the photo, they tell you how much it's going to cost and how much and who to contact. Now, most of these pups um, are taken from the wild. The mothers are killed. Uh, they put them into suitcases and then they export them to different parts uh, of uh, Southeast Asia. There are, for example, otter cafes in Japan. Um, there are 13 to 14 identified auto cafes now in Japan. So you can go to Japan, uh, order a cappuccino and pay a cover charge and pet an auto. Um, and these are sort of the things that are reinforcing the idea that, yeah, you know, it's a really good idea to keep otters as a pet. And it's not. They're really nice to keep as pets, perhaps as, as puppies. Uh, but when they grow up, they are carnivores. They do bite. They do destroy things. And they require... Um, certain types of, um, you know, husbandry guidelines to, to survive. They require water, they require land, they require all kinds of things. You can't just keep them in a cage. They do not survive. And so when they die, 
uh, they again the whole process starts again they go and get them from the wild etc etc um so what is driving the pet trade is essentially uh, cute photographs and cute videos on social media so there is a lot of you know videos of what is in captivity they're doing really sweet things and that that is essentially driving the trade people see that and they say well i want one if they can have one i want one when do i get one and then they start searching and and that's what's driving the trade um so yeah that is um, just another example of uh, how uh, wildlife is being sold online again this is on facebook so facebook and instagram is currently uh, the trading locations for um, otters um yeah so the final part of my presentation is basically some animal husbandry guidelines and this is specific to this smooth coated otter um i will i will stay on each of the slides for the for a little bit so that everybody you know kind of uh, can read through but also you can get in touch with me uh and i would be happy to give you complete guidance on 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 all all things uh, husbandry if that is necessary so yeah just reach out to me uh for those things but essentially it is recommended you know per animal it is recommended to have a 100 meter square area uh it's recommended to have at least 20% water and 80% land um you need a dry area for resting and grooming and digging is very essential um it's advised to have grass soil pebbles rather than concrete concrete can actually be very injurious it can cause uh, scratches it can cause damage uh, and and sores so try and avoid concrete uh, it was concrete they like places to hide like hollow logs uh, lots of trees and vegetation uh, and grass um and of course something that they can dig Uh, and create burrows if they can if burrows is not an option then of course nests i will talk about that in the next uh, couple of slides uh the water area it's recommended to have you know up to at least 29 degrees centigrade of water 26 to 29 degrees uh, shallow on one end deep on one end easy access you know sloping banks like i said they have a specific morphology so they don't like climbing steep gradients they need that Uh, shallow stuff to you know come in and go out um they need areas to exercise and be able to swim essentially it's it's not just giving them the water but giving them the space where they can you know swim um sand surrounding the pond can be really good for them but uh, make sure that there is nothing sharp in there they need that to kind of uh, uh, maintain their coats so smooth coated otters have very interesting uh coats that have two forms of hair they have short hair and, and larger guard hairs and it's the most densely sort of uh, populated hair structure in the entire animal kingdom because they need these insulated properties to deal with that change in temperature between water and land so they have to have to maintain those coats and they do that through grooming they rub themselves and and there's a lot of grooming that you know releases oil and things that maintain that coat so it's important to give them the substrate that facilitates that and of course fresh drinking water uh, possibly that is separate from the pond uh, is essential um so barriers of course we need these barriers it's recommended to have about 1.5 meter high barrier with kind of a, 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 a overturned overhang on the top The other thing that is important is to not go you know deep into the ground straight they recommend that you go on a curve so go underground to about 80 cm with an angle so when they do dig they don't get out they can't get out that kind of prevents them from getting out um as previously mentioned nest boxes are important uh, uh, place to be from sun rain wind in a quiet place where there are ventilation um, you know Uh, and multiple wooden boxes uh, also helps not just the one um because you know in natural habitat they don't have just one den they have multiple dens they have multiple den entrances in each den site and then they have multiple den sites as well so giving them just one box and saying this is your home is not ideal so give them the option of multiple places that they can sit in and swap between so they might spend one week here and one week here and things like that um they do in like bedding like grass and straw 
uh, shredded paper, wood shaving, all the perfect things. Uh, but of course, make sure that those um, bedding material are changed so that there is no parasites and stuff like that that uh, start living in them. Um, and they have free access to these nest boxes. It's not that they you know, have to be outdoors during the day and only in the nest boxes during the night. If they can have free access to that, uh, it would be ideal. And finally, the feeding stuff. Um, you know, so uh, as I said, they need to eat one uh, ten percent of their body weight. So if they have auto in captivity is uh, ten kgs, then they can eat one kg. Uh, ideally, spread across three different meals a day. Um, that is quite essential. It's quite important. And of course, uh, two or three extra enrichment feeds, which is basically uh, you know trying to find ways to get their food. They can you know play with toys that have stuff bring stuff in them that they can get out and things like that. Um, smooth coated water diet definitely needs to be 90% fish, fresh fish if possible, uh, the whole fish uh, to the adults and uh, small chunks uh, with the bones removed for young otters. If you're using frozen fish, of course, then you need to add supplements to them like vitamin E. Um, Depending on where you are, then it uh, you know what food, uh, what fish is given. So, uh, if you were perhaps in in, uh, in in Goa in a zoo, I would recommend tilapia uh, as uh, as the food to use. Uh, in most other places, they're using carp, um, uh, things like that. Um, day old chicks is ideal also uh, alongside the fish. Uh, maybe two chicks a day. Um, Tripe, which is basically uh, the stomach contents of other animals, uh, uh, can be useful. Chicken, heart, uh, liver, any of those things sort of can be supplemented, uh, which is which forms you know the main ten percent of the diet. Um, potassium citrate, uh, one fourth teaspoon per hour, twice a week, uh, can help prevent kidney stones. Uh, they, they they are quite susceptible to kidney stones and also to uh, bladder stones, uh, so that helps quite a lot. Uh, scatter feeding is important. You know, it's an enrichment activity. You can do that, for, you know, a couple of times a day. Uh, you can use uh, snails, earthworm, crickets, crayfish, anything like that. You can even use raw, soft boiled eggs uh, uh, to treat uh, or medicate an otter. So. Yeah, you know, just hide things sometimes so that you know, they have to, you know, look for things. Uh, and just, uh, they're very active animals that require a lot of encouragement and uh, activity and, and things like that. So encourage that as much as possible to make sure that they are happy otters and, uh, and things. So yeah, that comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you for having me and I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for no the valuable information and uh, uh, very deep uh, regarding this species. Uh, even we are uh, successfully building in our zoo, but whatever information you have given, uh, we have uh, first time getting this uh, minute information which we you are giving for supplementation and uh, different diets and all that yeah. thank you for giving your time and uh, from your busy schedule thanks again thank you madam thank you thank you bye bye okay bye